we have the next panel discussion on why therapy is not inclusive which is going to focus on what are the challenges and limitations of the existing mental health system particularly in india that are limiting the scope of therapy what is the problem because we have had uh, several mental health events um, inclusive mental health events before where people have discussed power differentials in therapy rooms or um, or mental health experts itself not being represented uh, based on their identity or how are are people really understanding the other uh, was the big question that uh, we have we have to address and this is what we are using this uh, particular panel discussion to do um to truly understand the other is what i would uh, like to say uh we have uh, that's exactly how we actually went ahead to curate this panel as well uh, while we have um we have three psychotherapists we also have uh, people who have been very closely associated uh, with the mental health system and come and come from communities um that are easily discriminated against based on their identities and how they have navigated spaces and where do they think change needs to come in um, so it's a it's it, it's we promise it is going to be a holistic perspective of uh, a both side kind of conversation uh, where say therapists who say do not belong to the communities that of the clients that they have um, are going to speak about how they navigate their experiences and how they navigate their um, work and also then we have people who belong to communities um, come and represent and speak about how it has to be different and how the conversation and dialogue in general has to change i'm just going to run everybody uh, through uh, the format of the discussion itself and uh, post which i will actually just give very very brief introductions about our um, our panelists today uh, though i would prefer if uh, they just go ahead and speak about uh, their work and work a little more uh, so i'll just uh, read out uh, read out or explain to you um, the briefs that we have about uh, the therapists and the uh, and christina and christy who are joining us today uh, firstly thank you so much for being here and um, the format is that i'll just give brief introductions uh, about each one of you probably just like one line and uh, read out each of your names after which you can just uh, take a minute or two to just speak about the work that you do the kind of work that you do and the organizations that you associate with and uh, what your experience with um, navigating the mental health care system has been uh, until now after which we obviously have questions um, for the panelists um, uh they are all structured questions uh, which means the conversation itself has a certain structure that we discussed before uh, which we will be presenting to you today uh so we have um, aastha aluwalia who's the chief psychologist and partner mm -hmm. at reboot uh, wellness center thank you so much aastha for joining us today and uh, for being such a integral part of the belong mental health collective since the very beginning uh, then we have christina dhanraj uh, who is an advisor for smashboard and creator for a uh, creator of dalit women thrive thank you christina for joining us from halfway across the world and also for all your beautiful inputs in the days leading up to the event um, we have christy who is an adivasi of the munda tribe uh, whose work lies in the intersections of adivasi transgender and child rights thank you so much christy for joining us uh, your inputs have always been valuable to the belong mental health collective and we are really really grateful that you're here today uh, we have rahul ghosh who's a psychologist and founder of a light mind therapy thank you so much uh, rahul for being here today and accepting to be here today uh, we really look forward uh, to the diversity that you're bringing into this panel today <laughs> and uh, also really want to understand um, your perspective on the different kind of work that you've done um, and i truly believe that one of the um explanations of how do you understand the other would be very apt when it comes from you we have zehra mehdi who is a, a trained psychoanalytic psycho psychotherapist and a phd scholar at columbia university thank you zehra for uh, being here today and thank you for all your inputs and all your questions till date uh, it's been a delight uh, talking to you all before and i look forward to a great session i'm just going to go in the same order and let you all speak a little more about yourself uh, asta if you could just go first uh hi asta thank you for the introduction uh and uh, thank you for having this discussion uh, ever so often that you have been uh, it's been a great uh, motivator for me not only as a mental health practitioner for, but as a person 
you know, who has also seeked mental health, uh, you know, services in the past uh, and continue to seek to, uh, you know, shape, uh, reshape how I run my organization. Uh, so I, uh, you know, as last I mentioned, I'm a chief psychologist at Reboot Wellness. Um, I essentially function out of the humanistic existential school of thought. Uh, we run a mental health center where we are leaving a mat for uh, all to stand on. That's our motto that, you know, we're trying to be as inclusive as we can. And we're trying to, you know, provide uh, mental health services in terms of counseling, uh, psychotherapy, uh, assessments, and also uh, support groups to the community. So thank you. I'm really excited to be here with all the wonderful other panelists and have a wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you, you Lasya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Lasya, for having me here. And thank you so much for Team Belong. Uh, special hi to Christy because we didn't quite catch up during the uh, preparatory session. So welcome. And I'm really happy to see you all again. I think our preparatory discussion in itself was a very powerful discussion where we spoke about many things that are very relevant to this intersection between diversity, identity, and mental health. Um, as you rightly pointed out, I'm currently um, the, uh, an advisor to Smashboard, um, but I also started off an Instagram handle called as Dalit Women Thrive. Um, the idea behind this Instagram handle is to essentially move from um, conversations and discourses that are primarily focused on survival to that of uh, a world where Dalit women and particularly QTNB uh, people from the Dalit community can imagine thriving, can um, can can work towards a good life, a fullness of life where where we are not just seeking ways in which we have to get out of our victimized sort of situations, but also imagine tools and resources. And, and conversations around what thriving and life means. Uh, earlier on to this, uh, I was working as a volunteer, uh, a strategy consultant for Dalit Women Fight. Um, I was also one of the co-founders for Dalit History Month. Um, so there's been a, quite a lot of work that has been done um, as far as um, the politics around how we see um, this world from the perspective of a Dalit has um, a lot of work has been done around that, but uh, not a lot of work has gone into this intersection of mental health and what it means to be uh, Dalit. Uh, I think I could be instrumental, hopefully, in creating that discourse. Uh, and I have started off writing a few pieces around it, and hopefully, this conversation is one of those things um, that will help you know uh, get us to the next level. Thank you for having me here. Um, Johar, everyone. Um, thank you for having, like, first of all, thanks to Team Blue Dawn for having this discussion. Um, I feel like this conversation is in itself really important for us to move, um, uh, for us to move from a very individualistic approach of mental health to looking at communities and what communities have been talking about. Um, I have been working on mental health concerns. Uh, I am a member of uh, Blue Dawn. And uh, through Blue Dawn, we have been working and having discourses on these lines of, of how structures have been uh, affecting uh, mental health and how the, uh, on the intersection of structures and mental health. So um, that is there. And uh, otherwise, I'm an uh, MPhil uh, PhD student at DSS. So my name is Rahul, as you all know by now. Uh, first of all, thank you to Team Belong for having this uh, discussion. It's a very important to the state of the mental health, the state of mental health in our country. Uh, so a bit of a background on me, I have uh, degrees in rehabilitation psychology and in work and organizational psychology. I've also done extensive research work that has given me the opportunity to work with uh, victims of domestic violence and the perpetrators as well. And I've had some interesting experiences right from the point of time where I started my education to uh, all the way to my research where I have uh, encountered diversity at different levels and uh, the importance of inclusivity rather at different levels. And uh, I'm really hopeful uh, that uh, we can have a fruitful discussion today. And uh, there are a few things that come out that uh, uh, maybe we can all put into practice in our own rights and uh, take mental health forward. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zera. I am, as you have heard, I'm a trained uh, psychoanalytical psychotherapist. Uh, so it 
it suffices that I speak at the last so I can have a sense of what everybody else has spoken. <laughs> and uh, so I've been doing this, I've been doing psychoanalysis for the last 10 years. Um, it is, well, I was trained, well, you know, all kinds of psychoanalysis is basically Freudian. Uh, but we, it's, it's a lot of inequality, it's a lot about interpersonal and um, the relationship between the client uh, and the analyst. Besides that, for the last five years now, actually, I've been in, in Colombia and doing my PhD on um, psychoanalysis, Muslim identity, and um, Hindu nationalism. I'm interested in um, questions of political and psychoanalytical subjectivity. So what is the role of, the, of psychology or psychoanalysis in the making of political subjectivity? In the past, I've worked on with uh, a lot of partition narratives. I've worked with uh, communal riot situations, particularly in UP, where I'm from. And uh, currently, I was, before the COVID thing happened, I was in India for a year working in UP on uh, situations, the everydayness of communal violence and the threat of it. And I'm so glad that we're here talking about something which is so relevant um, that it has managed to be relevant across time. And uh, I, can't, I, I can't imagine that we would have been at a time and place where this would have not been important. And it's glad to have a topic where you can have different voices without having them to be, uh, without them being contrived, but being more organic, as they say, to the entire discussion. I'm actually going to quickly start off with the questions. Um, and uh, so I think my first question is to Christina. Um, and we just want to do this to address the basic, basic, the most basic question is, what are the challenges in accessing mental health for communities that face identity-based discrimination today? Um, I would also welcome Christy to talk about it. So I don't think that this is just a question for me um, and, and other panelists too. But I think um, uh, during our preparatory uh, conversation, we spoke about this. And uh, this is the most basic question that we need to start off with as to why mental health um, tools that are currently available, particularly the, um, uh, the services that are being offered, um, mental therapy, overall is not working for everyone. So that is the most basic question that needs to be answered and you've, you've asked it correctly. In my opinion, of course, I think there are three reasons. One is the lack of infrastructure, two, the lack of knowledge, and three, the lack of representation. By infrastructure, we are talking about uh, all kinds of resources, uh, lack of accessibility, affordability, uh, a counseling session when I went through it, even though it was online and one on one would cost me 1000 rupees per session. And to me, that was very affordable because I come with a certain uh, privilege, but that is not necessarily affordable for the majority of people and particularly those that come from uh, disenfranchised communities, though that come, those that come from marginalized communities, particularly those that cannot afford uh, that much of uh, an expenditure for just one session. And, um, and there's always this undercurrent that uh, undercurrent argument that's inside of us uh, that keeps asking this question like why are you paying thousand rupees for just a conversation like what what are you going to gain out of it um, and so i mean those of us who come from those communities have been uh, have always been asked to make that choice between uh, you know what is really required what is the must need for the moment, which is most often food and clothing and, you know, all of those basic needs vis-a-vis -vis mental health, right? So that we are constantly being asked to make that choice. So when, when there is no infrastructure, when there is no affordable infrastructure, that in itself becomes very uh, inaccessible for us. Secondly, is this lack of knowledge? Where is this discourse around, as Christy rightly pointed out earlier, where is this discourse around you know, identity and, and mental health. Where is that intersection? Um, where are the articles around it? Where are the stories around it? Uh, what kind of therapy should you be giving? What kind, of, what kind of tools should you be suggesting? What kind of conversations should, be having, should you be having? So that discourse, that knowledge, that lived experience is, is definitely lacking. And thirdly, of course, is the lack of representation because uh, if I need therapy, 
um, uh, of course, I subject to the privilege that I'm having, I might most likely get a, a fantastic uh, therapist who will be able to invest uh, their time and effort into what is personally going wrong or going great with me. But that may not be the case for everyone. Because most often in India, therapists are upper caste, are upper class, come from a certain identity. And uh, there is also this whole power uh, differential, which we will get to it in a bit. But uh, to be able to trust a therapist that does not have my lived experience is, is definitely difficult. So not having um, therapists that come from marginalized communities or having marginalized identity and therefore will not be able to get my exact situation and by me, I don't mean individually, but collectively, um, the marginalized communities, lived experience and situation is a problem as well. Thank you so much uh, for listing them down uh, so well, um, Christina. Uh, Christy, if you could also uh, answer that question, if you have, um, yeah. And taking the discussion forward, uh, lack of infrastructure is one of the primary reasons that even I feel uh, is... Uh, is a hindrance to accessibility of mental health services. Um, one is, uh, uh, if we look into all ma like mental health services that is there, uh, it's majorly in the metropolitan cities in India. So uh, what about uh, the towns and villages? Like, there are mental health services, ki hai, but then there are no services available uh, in those areas. Um, the uh, second thing that I want to stress upon is, um, the knowledge of mental health itself is a problematic because it uh, it, the, it in itself kind of um, quote unquote others uh, many many communities it still follows the dsm model the diagnostic statistical manual of mental disorders and in that in that entire discourse it is like we need to uh, i understand that this entire model is developed by uh, majorly cisgendered white men and in Indian context, it is the Brahmin men who have taken hold of this entire knowledge system. So in that discourse, Dalit and Adivasi communities are anyways, um, like their way of life is anyways uh, deemed not normal. And that comes under like, ha, thik, ab usko karek karne ki hai. one example that I can give of is the uh, conversion therapy. Uh, when, when it comes to queer individuals, that, uh, that discourse has been happening. And recently we saw in Goa that, uh, uh, that one uh, queer woman uh, uh, gave, up, uh, gave up her life. I see it as institutional murder committed by the, this entire mental health uh, structure that is there that still follows DSM model, that still, uh, uh, quote unquote, um, decides that okay, this way of life is not normal and needs character needs correction. Um, the third thing that I want to mention is uh, the entire approach is individual. We, uh, the mental health discourse kind of completely negates the structures that is there. Um, then how we, then uh, like the way I look at mental health is it is not in isolation. It is connected with multiple things. It is layered. And if we are not engaging with those layers, if we are not engaging with the, uh, the, with the multiple layers that is there that is leading to the mental health issue of the individual, then what, uh, what are we doing about it? Um, just one example that I can give off is um, as an uh, Adivasi child going to school, uh, go, attaining formal education, but the entire education system the child has to learn a, a, a diku, a alien language, either Hindi or English or the or Marathi if it is Maharashtra or Bengali if it is Bengal, and the and the entire education system does not have Adivasi stories. It does not have uh, the uh, Adivasi political systems that is there. It does not bring in the cultural value system that the child sees in, in their uh, in their home or in their villages. And they have to learn this entire completely alien, completely different uh, structures. And if the, and in school, then like if the child is not able to perform well, then the child is diagnosed as having some learning disability or having some learning problems. It is the structure is not questioned there. Then how like in what way are, are we engaging with this mental health discourse? I don't see that the child has problem. It is the structural problem that is there. 
um, the third, uh, the fourth thing that I want to stress on is the Mental Health Act 2014. Um, uh, this act has a loop, it has its loopholes, but at the same time, it is uh, important because it has a shift. Uh, this act has a shift from, um, uh, and it uh, recognizes the consent and the individuals who are having organizations uh, are there. But at the same time, this no one is talking about Mental Health Act. No one knows about this act and what are the clauses that is there and how people can avail their rights when it comes to men. So we need to bring in the discourses on Mental Health Act as well. Of course, this act has its loopholes, but at the same time, it does talk about accessibility a lot. So we need to focus on from a, and it has a rights based approach. It does it point of this act. So we need to have discourses around this act as well and make it more accessible as in uh, until unless we do not use the act, the state or the government will not do anything about the act. It will just remain in papers. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Christy. I think uh, that was an extremely, extremely insightful and a very uh, tone setting um, in input uh, that we all have to start considering is that when we look at mental health, it's not an individual's problem. Um, it's a human rights problem. It's a social justice problem. It's a community problem. And um, on, on that line, I'm just going to go to this question is actually something I'm going to open to all uh, open to Asta, Rahul and Zera. Uh, so let's ask some basic questions again. We'd want to know your perspective on this. Um, uh, why is therapy not working for everyone today? This is a very similar question. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I actually wanted to add to what uh, Christy said uh, on particular two things. Number one, of course, what he said about the DSM is absolutely correct, you know, uh, but uh, it is but when you're looking at mental health, you're looking at two ends, right? When somebody comes to you, when a client comes to you, uh, it doesn't matter who they are, you have to first diagnose them. And the other end is the therapeutic approach you end up taking. Uh, and the problem with the DSM is that until even about 10 or 11 years ago, like Christy mentioned the example of uh, uh, conversion therapy. Uh, there's other there's been other approaches uh, uh, for example people uh, queer people who have been struggling with their identities have gone to therapists uh, not just in India but the world over this is research out of Netherlands they've gone to therapists and said uh, look I feel really disenfranchised from my office uh, place or my workplace I don't know what to do about it and it's affecting me so the therapist would in turn tell them that uh, hey uh, use information management it's none of their business you know, and in the end, it'll make you feel confident. Now, research has found that in the short term, it may make you feel confident, right? But in the long term, now more recent research close to, I think, 2015 and 16 has discovered, and finally out of the same place, is that it actually increases a sense of uh, disenfranchisement from the workplace because they're hiding the real identity they're hiding who they really are. And so if you have therapeutic approaches that are doing that, it's even more dangerous. It's even worse. Because why do we, you know, because if you look up any literature on work, organizational psychology, you will find that uh, your uh, relationship with your workplace has huge implications for your mental health. And it is a jumping off point for anxiety, depression, and so many other things. Uh, and uh, of course, what I also wanted to add to the other thing that I wanted to add to that uh, Christy had said was about the Mental Health Act. Um, uh, I would actually go one step further and say that, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a Mental Health Act, but if you go to the UK or if you go to the US, they are governing bodies and they take it so seriously that, you know, the code of ethics is just quite literally copy pasted uh, from what you study in university and it is put into the law, right? So everything about confidentiality, all of this. And so there's proper systems in place to protect people as well, right? In India, you don't have that. And I was having a discussion on ethics with a colleague of mine, funnily enough, just this morning. And uh, we were talking about how if we ended up 
uh, violating the code of ethics and we were talking about the uh, american counseling association code of ethics to be very uh, precise uh, that how if we violated one of these things uh, nothing really would happen you know it's really only our fear of uh, or our own sort of super ego that sort of keeps kind of pushing us to sort of do the right thing so you know i mean like uh, the situation actually is uh, not really good on that front and it doesn't make uh, the whole uh, picture sort of uh, better or you know likely to get better in the near future all right thanks uh, thank you for actually pointing out the institutional issues also rahul um so the question uh, will come back to is why is therapy not working for everyone today asha if you could go first on that yeah so i think uh, mental health as a concept is gaining is beginning to gain pace now uh, not just for a certain section of the society but for for the general population right um however uh, um there is a lack of awareness amongst uh, the society about what mental health is what all does it include uh, because mental health has always been viewed from a lens of disorder and illness right um, and which is why the dsm4 and all of that uh, you know that exists uh, also uh, the lack of awareness uh, amongst people who are seeking help what are the reasons that we need to seek help for and more severely the uh, the lack of awareness that is present in uh, you know the mental amongst the mental health professionals now when we are training to be mental health professionals therapists psychologists etc Uh, a lot of our focus is on you know is on identifying okay what is what are the what are certain disorders uh, you know how do we deal with those disorders what are the different kinds of therapies etc cetera, etc cetera. and one of the major things that you know that we miss out on is the other uh, cultural ethnic uh, you know societal uh, community nuances which in, which which we know which we know as therapists and psychologists that impact an individual's identity uh, very very drastically so we're not uh, you know the there is a there is a lack of there is a severe lack of awareness in terms of understanding the diversity that exists in our society uh, you know in and in the different uh, populations to understand their trauma we need to understand where they're coming from their history uh, you know their ethos etc uh, also the one of another you know hindrance that i see and this is a, this is a feedback that i've gotten in very many different forums uh when i've spoken about inclusive mental health and you know accessibility and why therapy is not working and even otherwise for uh, you know for people who are seeking therapy is the is the therapist biases so because we are we are you know there is so much of uh, heteronormity uh, existing and caste biases playing in our you know therapy rooms that it is difficult for the uh, for the client to actually feel um, you know feel that the therapist is actually empathizing with them because the therapist is governed by their biases and one of the reasons that they are governed by their biases is because none of these uh, you know not, we we are not we not even spoken about all of this when we are taught we are told that yes we have to be aware of the cultural nuances and all of that and uh, you know um, we are told all of this but where is where is the you know the formal uh, uh, introduction to it and like me personally in in the 13 years that i have been practicing as a therapist i know that i have had times when i I have gone and worked in Chhattisgarh and MP and done projects there. When I've met people, that's when I've opened, you know, the internet and I've opened books and I've spoken to people. I've joined organizations to equip myself in understanding, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the psychology or the psyche of the people that I'm dealing with. And the same thing goes for the LGBTQI, uh, you know, community. Uh, I mean, I had a I had a client uh, from the LGBTQ community uh, some ten years back or twelve years back. and uh, you know uh, i i it took me it took me a lot of personal reading up to do in order to understand that because that wasn't the a part of the education that i was given so i think that is uh, uh, you know the lack of awareness in all these three aspects in the uh, you know as a part of the society the the mental health professional community that we are part of in terms of our training and also those who are seeking help that is one of the big reasons why therapy is not inclusive and of course uh, the you know um, and i think uh, Christina and Christy both spoke of uh, accessibility. And I think Christy specifically said that um, mental health services are not available in smaller cities, which is a fact. Uh, we we don't have mental health services available in smaller cities, and I also see a big gap in uh, you know at a policy level of how how these how a mental health is included in terms of our health plan and how the amount of importance that it is getting. 
yeah thank yeah. you so much for pointing that out yeah we nobody i don't think uh, there is any discourse and con- enough discourse and conversation around mental health in our healthcare policy uh, that currently exists or uh, not enough of it um actually zera if you could answer that next and then i'll pass it on to uh, rahul uh, where is the problem see the problem in talking second or third is when the first person has already said all the interesting things and all the things that you wanted to say then now you have to come up with something really smart such pressures no okay so one of the thing the, the first thing when i was thinking is why is therapy not working for everyone i think my first response was like it shouldn't work for everyone because to believe that everybody needs therapy is actually frankly a little dangerous and really blurs this idea of what therapy can do and who can be really who can actually use it and when so i think that sort of becomes very important particularly in a, in a society like ours and i'm saying this after having five years of a grad school uh, in new york where our society despite the fact that we're becoming very we have become very individualistic and we all very independent and person centric despite our unwillingness we still retain a very strong familiar bonds and it can it can manifest it doesn't have to manifest in great family ties always but what we call well in some way we call transference is that that kind of intensity of a relationship you take to friends you have mentors you have supervisors you have paros wali chachi who's very nice to you and talking to you and is concerned about you so i think that it's important to also realize that there are certain conditions certain scenarios in which therapy is important and must be given but also it's dangerous if we start pathologizing in that sense everything so that's the first thing second thing i think i'll just uh, sort of add to two pens to what um, asta so wonderfully said about the fact that i think um, not everybody can imagine um, can be in like it, it's not working for everyone because therapy can't imagine what it is to talk to somebody who comes and is not just radically different but has just, just but just has never been imagined you don't know how an individual let's see well i'm muslim so i'll just talk about how an individual who is a practicing muslim can come where her faith is not the problem where the kind of life she lives creates a not just a different world but a world which you have worked towards not understanding so if you are a so called secular therapist you are screwed because then then religion is the opium of the masses then the fact that you are religious that's a problem in itself and i've seen people who in a discussion of this um of a case they were like oh this woman is very rigid and i and after some time i was like what gives you a sense that she is rigid or oh, she is she is a practicing uh hindu or muslim whatever and i was like wow so just because she's practicing she can become uh, she can become rigid you can go to the gym that's practice why isn't that rigidity so i think it's important to also realize that there is a certain you know as in psychoanalysis we use all these literary language in which says you have to dream the patient can you dream the patient and i i think it becomes important to kind of admit that we can't to be able to access what what we can do about it last and quickly because again as i said as i said everything that i wanted to say and i'm sure rahul is going to add um that identities are not symptoms yet they have a narrative of of trauma that comes with who they are for example if somebody comes i remember uh, actually i was thinking when i was was talking that one of my earliest patients was actually somebody who identified as gay and that is not why he was coming to me i think that's extremely important to understand that people from a certain discriminated forgotten absent spaces come to you not because the fact that they are forgotten in fact the fact that whatever stress issue conflict they are coming with is exacerbated because of that sort of a um, discrimination i think that becomes very very important because it's a very slippery slope you need to actually want to help but you may actually end up re traumatizing the patient uh yeah that's it 
Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Zera, for also that extremely quotable line where you said identities are not symptoms. Um, yeah, Rahul, if you would like to add to that. I completely agree with what Zera said because uh, when I was doing my research uh, in Australia, there was a point of time where uh, so we were uh, actively sort of uh, talking to uh, victims of domestic violence, right? And uh, once uh, and once I got trained, and my research supervisor was happy, so he said, "Okay, it's time for you to jump in." And uh, I saw that there were uh, the victims uh, were there were some uh, same-sex partners as well. Uh, one, uh, of course, was in prison, and the other one I was uh, going to meet. And I was very honest with my supervisor. I said, "I've never interviewed someone." Uh, uh, that identity and I don't bring anything to the table. Why would they identify with me? Why would they really talk to me? So, you know, he's, and he funnily enough said the same thing to me. He said, you're not talking to him because he's gay. You're talking to him because he's a victim of domestic violence. And if something comes up in conversation that you, you know, uh, uh, don't know about, uh, use your principles, use the basic principles of therapy where you're developing trust, where you're maintaining confidentiality and where you're not sort of uh, pretending to, uh, uh, where, where you're not pretending to sort of sermonize to someone. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me uh, because when I went into uh, the conversation with this person and I won't share too much, I'll just share a brief, uh, you know, part of the conversation. And basically, uh, I think about 15 or 20 minutes into the conversation, um, uh, it was pretty evident that I was nervous. So I said, okay, let me own this nervousness. All right. And I said to this person that, uh, look, um, you know, this is the first time I'm in this situation and uh, I hope I'm not making you uncomfortable at this thing. And funnily enough, he said to me, look, uh, I've been seeing so many psychologists and I've been seeing women, women, women. I'm actually happy you're here. So <laughs> it kind of worked out both ways, you know. And so it's absolutely very true. Uh, uh, I think what's very important and what Zera said is the act of being empathetic and being sensitive. Uh, I think that's what I take away also from what Zera meant by that in the end. Uh, it's very important to be uh, sensitive and empathetic and it really helps with the overall therapeutic process. Uh, thank you so much for that, Rahul. And also thank you so much for telling us so much about uh, your own uh, hindrances and challenges when you were um, trying, when you're going for your first few patients, um, or clients rather. Um, the next question is actually uh, directed towards Christina again. Are there mental health professionals from communities we want to help out um, or we want to include in the mental health system, just speaking about it from the boxed context of this conversation? Uh, tell us about what you think uh, of the kind of representation in the mental health space in our country today. Uh, when we say that, I mean, I mean more in the sense of professional representation in the mental health space in our country today. Christina, over to you. Thank you. I think one of the things, and, and thank you, Zara, for bringing up some very important nuances in this uh, mental health discourse and how that relates to marginalized identities. I just want to touch upon one thing before we move on to this question, and perhaps it might be also related to this answer, is that this conversation around inclusion, conversation around, you know, we have to understand the other uh, this this assumption that you know identities are not symptoms all of this at some at some level is assuming that the person who's administering the therapy happens to be from a non marginalized context happens to be most often cis hetero upper caste upper class not the other you know it, it kind of assumes that there is this center in which you need to include people from marginalized identities. So this power differential has already been assumed, right? Which is why this is a slippery slope, as Zera rightly mentioned. We cannot, we cannot so confidently say identities are not symptoms, but at the same time, 
um, not realize that that identity that there's, there can be trauma that's associated with that identity, right? So there's a lot, lot of trauma that comes with the identity and the experiences that we have by virtue of that identity. And the trauma needs to be addressed. So there is, there, and all of that wisdom as to how to go about uh, treading the slippery slope as to how about you address those nuances will come only if you know what it means to have that marginalized lived experience, right? And so this entire system of where the center is still being occupied by someone who's privileged and the therapy is being administered to someone who's not, this assumption needs to change. And it's not just an assumption, it's probably the reality as well. This entire setup needs to change. It has to shift. And with that in mind, yes, of course, there are very few mental health professionals from marginalized communities. The Blue Dawn Initiative, and Christy can speak more to it, is one of those very few initiatives that are available that looks at community care, that looks at uh, you know, layers of how mental health uh, operates and how discrimination, caste-based trauma influences and impacts all of our um, all of our living situations, the way we perceive ourselves, the way we perceive others, the way we perceive power, and the way we perceive rooms, mental, um, uh, mental health uh, therapeutic rooms. Like, you know, when you enter into a room where there is this therapist who happens to be upper caste, who looks a certain way, who comes from a certain lived experience, even before you enter that room, th that power is already decided. So I'm not sure how much this person from a marginalized identity will be able to uh, trust this person with their, with their problems, right? But more importantly, uh, as, you, as you had asked, uh, uh, Lesya, uh, if you don't have somebody who can understand what your lived experience is, is this entire uh, therapy, therapy model becomes uh, inaccessible, useless, uh, and not so effective. And uh, should we have more mental health professionals from the marginalized community? Absolutely, yes. And that, for that, we need to go back to, you know, uh, education and who are the trained people. Uh, do people from these marginalized communities want to be trained in mental health? Is that something that they would like to pursue, given the structures that are already in place? For example, if uh, as, as, as a Dalit woman that grew up, I did not even have a choice to do humanities. I chose to go into science because my family was convinced, every one of us were convinced that, you know, taking the science um, uh, path was, was the surest way to survive, was the surest way to uh, make money. And, and that was very much dependent on the lower middle class background I, I came from. Maybe now, if I was given a choice, I would definitely pursue a mental health career. So all of this is also very much dependent on the structures we are growing up in, the communities are growing up in. So I think this, this um, and we will talk about this, you know, when we talk about overhaul and all of that. So this whole concept of mental health being one-on-one, -on -one, uh, being administered only through a certain model wherein you pay a therapist a certain amount of money and get that mental health back, that needs to change, that needs to shift as well. And, and in, in that world, in that ideal context, maybe we will have more mental health professionals who are coming from this background, but they may not, who are coming from marginalized backgrounds, but they may not necessarily resemble the type of therapist that we are used to seeing the profiles of therapists that we are used to seeing. And we need to get comfortable with that kind of a, a world. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for multiple perspectives on that, actually. That was a very layered answer. Um, actually, like the next, and also thank you for uh, speaking about power differentials and therapy rooms, right? That's actually the next question that uh, we have for Christy. Um, Christy, if you could, we, we've spoken about this earlier. So if you could tell me how power differentials in mental health systems or therapy rooms actually play out, like if you could explain it, uh, in more words than what we used earlier, because that is a very uh, important conversation for today. Christy, over to you. Before getting into the question that you asked, I just want to add to what Christina mentioned. Um, uh, I would actually love to see more mental health practitioners, uh, professionals from 
um, uh, from various Bahujan communities, from various Adivasi Dalit communities. Uh, but at the same time, for me, what is more crucial is this entire uh, this entire discourse of mental health is I, the way I look at it is colonized. It is colonized by the um, uh, by the Savarna Brahmins in Indian context, and we need to decolonize that. Until and unless that fundamental shift does not take place, I don't know how we will how we can move ahead. Because uh, in this entire discourse of mental health, per se, many uh, the uh, the way of life of various communities of various individuals is deemed not normal. So how do we uh, navigate all those all those uh, all those micro things? Uh, yes, of course we need like if there is representation in individuals uh, uh, amongst in, in the mental health professionals, uh, there would be a shift. But at the same time, there has to be a fundamental shift in the mental health discourse itself, moving from um, the individualistic. Uh, and the other thing that I want to stress upon is also um, uh, uh, mental health. Like this is. Uh, mental health professionals also, as pointed out by the uh, mental health professional in the panel here, um, have this, uh, I'm not, I'm, I do not want to point out anything, but I just want to mention that there's a tendency of prescribing and, or, and of identifying and of, and of diagnosing. But, uh, uh, and one thing that kind of lacks, and I just want to quote here, not exactly quote, I don't remember what America uh, uh, she is a Latino mental health uh, professional. Uh, she uh, she has said I'm, I'm not I cannot exactly quote her, but mentioning what she has said, um, we have learned to engage with problems, but we have failed to engage with individuals. And that is something which is kind of required. We need to learn to engage rather than the problems. The present mental health uh, discourse and the model that we is being followed is trying to identify the problems and work with the problems rather than with the individual. Which and the moment we start engaging with the individual, then we'll start looking at the layers and the structures. So that is something which is required. Um, moving to the question that you asked, uh, I guess in the previous conversation that we were having, uh, I mentioned uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, a queer person go uh, uh, yeah, in a therapy room. Like if in the therapy room, if we are seeing uh, symbols that portrays heteronormativity, then how we will engage with the therapy? Then how we will take the therapy? If the entire discourse is uh, surrounding heteronormativity, then how we will perceive and uh, uh, gauge this entire therapy room and the therapy at, at the same time? Uh, again, talking from... Um, uh, this is something which a friend kind of told me. She um, she went to a therapy room and uh, she went to visit a therapist. And the first thing that she sees in the therapy room is the statue for Gan of Ganesh. And she comes from, uh, and that is something which triggered her. Because again, she was like, okay, how will I then talk about the various uh, issues that I have seen or because of caste discrimination? I've already seen Ganesh there. So how will I negotiate and navigate those, those things with the therapist then? So uh, these small, small symbols also plays crucial role when it comes to therapy. Uh, and it talks a lot. It talks volumes to the uh, person, um, to the person uh, availing the services. Um, Thank you so much uh, for that, Christy. And my next question would actually be for Asta. Asta, if you're uh, unmuted yourself already. Uh, so... This question is, let's speak about the times we are living in. Um, how has mental health and the space uh, changed or how is it changing during the pandemic? I think the pandemic has uh, has become quite a leveler for uh, understanding mental health. And, and I say this, I've been saying this for the last two months that uh, what the lockdown has done for mental health in two months, we probably wouldn't have been able to achieve for you know the next uh, for the next five seven years maybe and it is it is an it's a very agreed leveler because now everybody is experiencing something there are there is lack of distracted stimuli uh, there are not in I can't I can't uh, like if I if I have uh, experienced domestic violence I can't put powder on my face and go to work and feel better about myself and come back I cannot 
uh, if I am if I've had a fight with someone or if I'm if my parents are not accepting of my gender identity I cannot you know go out and maybe have a few drinks with my friends and feel better about it or the vice versa for the you know for the abuser or the um, you know or the family members who are not being everybody is put in you know in in a in a specific limited space which is which is putting pressure and all of us are experiencing uh, you know a certain amount of uncertainty uh, overwhelming uh, you know intimidating feelings and what it has done is that it has shifted the conversation from okay let's talk about you know about uh, of mental health from let's talk about illnesses and let's talk about disorders and let's diagnose and let's see what's wrong with you to okay i'm experiencing this i have feelings i have thoughts i have emotions i have you know i have a mind which uh, which needs to feel well uh, there is far and more emphasis now on well being uh, there is more uh, conversation around mental health in the word health like being healthy uh, and rather than being uh, rather than diagnosing what is wrong uh, there is a lot more focus on being functional as as you know that's become the basis now that how functional are we and that has unified a lot of conversation around mental health it has changed and you know i say this um, all of us are um, we all realize that we all have a mind and we all have realized that we all have thoughts and we all have emotions and we all have feelings and all of them need to you know uh, and they and we they will go up and down so it has what it has done is it has changed the conversation about mental health it has also uh, you know helped to talk more about um, you know more about general feelings and have got about this acceptance that these general feelings are there with everyone it's it's a human thing and it does not mean that you need a diagnosis it does not mean that you need uh you know a conversation it does not mean that you need to go into a you know 10 session therapy a be it a cbt or a psychoanalytic uh, you know therapy it just means that your feelings your thoughts your emotions matter and that has been a great shift uh you know in, with with the with the lockdown the shift in you know conversation and you know all of that so i think uh what the space has evolved is evolving and it is it is bringing forward a lot more uh, you know conversations around mental health thank you so much uh, for that asta uh, it was a, it was um, i'm guessing it's some light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic uh, so <laughs> if there were to be one um yeah. the next question is for zera uh, zera what are the ways in which certain communities and people are excluded from the mental health system today uh, how can people uh, who are currently excluded uh, be included okay so i'll keep in mind that uh, we would want to entertain questions so i'll be very cut 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 about it first of all i think as uh, christina said one of the ways people are not included first of all there's a lack of representation you don't see you don't see some people as therapists you don't have therapists i remember a friend as i was mentioning uh, i think to sanjana asking me uh, i think last to last year can you give me a book on psychoanalysis and cast and i was like hey guess what we don't we don't have any and he was shocked because well i was like you know guess what who seeks uh, psychoanalysis who gives psychoanalysis who 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 will write that book who will read that book which who's, who's going to publish that book see this is also how this ends up producing and reproducing this kind of structures structures are not imposed they are sustained so i think this kind of production seems we don't find people who look like us sound like us and i'm not saying that uh, for example if i go to therapy and as a muslim woman and i'm not saying that another muslim woman is going to exactly understand what i'm feeling that almost always never happens but still there's going to be something shared some modicum of a shared experience of a shared reality of a shared vocabulary at least uh, which will begin to imagine people that okay this is not a place where i have to feel weird or this is not a place that i have to that is where i am where the power equation is so displaced first of all second um instead of just i mean I, again i will just repeat myself um we are not able to imagine how let's see we as in mental health structures are not able to imagine how a dalit therapist would look like in when i say look like what would their experiences be how would what kind of work will their analysts be able to to do with them so it really keeps a certain 
kind of experience completely out and when it's out as um, christy said it is pathologized so and you know it's it's a well functioning system it makes sure some things never enter you know you 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 make it expensive people not going to enter you you make it english centric south delhi english centric 3000 rupees who's going to come a very very select people are going to come who are going to select the same language it's very difficult for my younger patients to sometimes um connect with me because i'm not a media savvy person i'm not a twitter person i don't even have a twitter handle in that sense as to post it becomes like what world do you live in i'm anyways gendered a relic and i'm not i mean i'm old but i'm not that old so i'm just saying that you know it's it's also the fact that how and this is just a very uh, we both belong to roughly the same social space that the the enormity of difference that comes within the same social space so imagine the kind that it comes in a completely different one it's a different vocabulary and and i'm again going to what christy said it's a different vocabulary we don't understand so it's not a question of when i say the third point being that the vocabulary of mental health is not that we haven't found somebody to translate it for us that oh if i find depression if i say depression or as rahul reminded super ego if i say it in a indian language it will make more sense yes but not just that it's not a problem of translation it's a problem of language how do you translate lajja how do you translate sharm you can't it's not embarrassment you are shy but you also pink but you also sometimes humiliated so i think this kind of so that is way absolutely therapy um, and at least in my case psychoanalysis is a completely colonial product completely colonized and it continues to be colonized also we take pride in it being colonized because that gives us a chance to be the white people we we are we are dying to be white people let's also believe that we are dying to be white no matter they will they can be accused of of getting the disease but we will still like white people so i think this is the pop this is the internalized colonization which which we keep on reproducing reproducing in the same power structure till the time india south asia i would say is ready to look within which basically means look at caste nothing is going to change in india india's problem is caste is like america's problem is race they just don't want to look at it and it it is like the return of the repressed it will come back and it will haunt you if you don't imagine and it's a painful task let me because then to sort of link how can we imagine uh we have to completely abolish the system i, I wanted to say overhaul but i think abolish sounds stronger so i want to completely abolish the system it's a system of op- op- oppression and it's premised to reproduce sustain and manufacture oppression where you know it's like it's like this um, one of my favorite writers uh, franz fanon he will say that the oppression is such where the black man will want to be like the white man so much is the hatred for the black that even the like my job within the community is yeah a good muslim is a secular muslim that has completely erased muslim identity that will that will not say some uh, assalam alaikum which will not say adab not say khuda fe so it will say hi and hello because it's safer and these are the way we have internalized we have been made to internalize it's a it's a dual play so this idea of empathy is also again a very dangerous one because it automatically puts us in a self righteous position we are hospitable we will host you which means i am still the master i am welcoming you in my house i am being nice to you see there is no way an equality can be imagined so i think till that kind of uh, um reimagining will happen when we will have to really realize our culpability we can't talk about equality uh, when we have say when we do we don't realize how we and our success is a response of stepping on someone's head it's not a very pleasant image it's tough it's very tough and you can't hide behind shame and guilt it is it's really in your face up and i'm just going to say it in hindi that 
आपका आपका सक्सेस किसी और के शोषण पर आधारित है इट्स बेस्ड ऑन इट इट यू सो सेइंग आई डेंट डू एनीथिंग इज अ पॉइंटलेस क्वेश्चन इट्स सो इनविजिबल दैट यू आर अ बेनिफिशियरी ऑफ इट दैट इज व्हाई मेन कांट क्वेश्चन पेट्रियाकी बिकॉज़ दे आर नॉट द विक्टिम्स दे आर द बेनिफिशियरीज ऑफ इट I think that is what we'll have to do. We'll have to really, really not just check our status, but sort of really think about it again. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for throwing light on that, Zaira. Um, that actually brings me to how uh, uh, how there was there's been uh, some discourse around how uh, if you want to actually study um, or identify your privilege or what you've actually done, you should actually look at things from the if from you shouldn't actually read about the stories of those who are oppressed but actually read about how you are oppressing them which actually is the radical introspection that we were talking about uh, that you mentioned in the practice session that you need to actually radically introspect what you have done as a community first uh, to oppress others um before and this is also something suraj young day uh, the all of caste matters uh, recently pointed out that um you you actually can't find any um any p anybody there are so many brahmin men trying to talk about how sub, how the problems that dalits are facing and writing immense number of papers and manuscripts on it but uh, they don't actually write ever about what they've done you know so it's 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 about radical introspection as in um that actually brings me to uh, rahul uh, since we were earlier having a conversation about can we really empathize and what is the extent till which one empathizes and where do we stop and say you know what i can't do it right yeah so we are having that conversation um so rahul that question for you would be you had clients uh, who belong to identities much if we have to use that word much unlike yours um that is that is the premise of this uh, a discussion also so how can a therapist be open to problems and challenges that they themselves might not have any first hand experiences of and can we really actually manage to gather that kind of empathy openness and or is it better to actually say you know i can't do it like where is the line that you uh, uh, am i audible yeah you're audible yeah, yeah so uh, my personal belief is that uh, and this is just my personal belief uh, before anything else uh, you can't you can't and if you go one step beyond that it is your ethical duty to say you can't you can't uh, one of my uh, colleagues very recently talked to me about a concept that she uses to drive her continued learning and her continued practice it is called conscious incompetence knowing what you're good at and knowing what you're not good at and i think that applies to sensitivity empathy everything because uh, uh, i had talked about this the other day uh, and there are people uh, and it at this is one thing that personally also angered me there there were people on twitter saying why are the migrants sleeping on the trains uh, on the train tracks uh, and that question itself you know if you have to ask that question that at that very moment you realize that uh, sorry you know you can't empathize because you just can't understand you don't even have even the remotest understanding to uh, be able to sort of put yourself not not just in their shoes but even in that situation uh, so it is always better to say that no you can't and then uh, that actually and funnily enough that actually allows you to create a better connection a better rapport with someone and you should also be responsible enough to tell people to say that look uh, if i don't work for you please feel free to walk away right beyond that <clears throat> one thing uh, that is absolutely there is uh, uh, that we all need to be able to uh, understand that language and especially the nuance of language is so important in the therapeutic process right as zera pointed out uh, uh, with that example of lajja right um till you know the language like that 
you won't you, you know you won't be able to understand the nuance because one basic thing that uh, if you uh, one basic thing that you learn as a therapist that the tone of your voice matters so much you know the question could be the same but if it is said in the wrong tone uh, that's going to create a problem right so and they and you also told please only use the language where you can talk where you know the names of the emotions properly in that language otherwise don't talk otherwise don't talk so that is a huge problem that we face in our country and uh, the problem and, and that is where you know picking up on uh, on what christina had said earlier uh, there's definitely representation needed uh, from people uh, uh, you know from uh, people from different backgrounds different communities uh, and it's needed badly, you know, and it's needed at the community level, because in India there is no community level support or an organization uh, that is a grassroots organization that's able to reach out to people. It's like I think uh, Zara said, uh, you know, three thousand rupees. Who's going to come to you? You know, uh, there are, uh, you know, a very, you know, an, an example of every whenever there's not no monsoons, farmers commit suicide. Farmers commit suicide out of hopelessness, out of despair, out of everything. Uh, there aren't even communities to be able to sort of reach out to them, uh, let alone sort of offer financial help, but let alone sort of just somebody be there and say, how can I help? How can I be of assistance? So there is absolutely a huge need at the community level. And that's where the mental health system in India is really, really uh, found wanting and has been found wanting for a very, very long time. If a difference has to be made and if uh, uh, the finer nuances have to be understood, then there has to be, of course, you know, uh, a lot of introspection and then a sense of decentralization, you know, where you let go, where I'll say, you know, like, I am fully aware of the privilege that I have. You know, I went to universities abroad to study. I cannot understand, you know, where power, where my authority is decentralized, my authority goes away, where I don't have to say, hey, I don't know, I'm sorry. You know, uh, where there is actually somebody who understands people and can help them. Uh, thank you so much, Rahul, for speaking about decentralization, uh, uh, the aspect of it, uh, which will actually help us take this conversation forward to the next question. Uh, if all of you could just, in few words, tell me how do you see the way forward? Like, how do you think uh, things can be made better? Um, Christina, you spoke about overhauling um, and I'm sure uh, Christy, Asa, Rahul and Zera have uh, different ways in which we look at this while going forward. So if you could, uh, in short words, tell me, each of you tell me, how do you see this going forward? And then we'll go to the audience's questions right after. One way of going forward is um, the thing that I mentioned a bit earlier, the, and which was pointed out by some of the panelists as well. We need to decolonize this entire discourse of mental health, um, which has been following the colonial setup. Uh, uh, established by the white men and in Indian context, it is uh, again percolates down. It again, um, uh, as pointed out by some of the panelists as well, it again, uh, uh, um, uh, again, uh, like uh, it again, uh, yeah, does not question structures, does not question caste, does not question indigeneity, does not bring out uh, about the various layers that is there. Uh, the second thing is we need to shift from the individual to um, uh, uh, it, to, a structural, uh, to a structural lens and understand mental health discourse from a structural lens. And the third thing is we need to listen to communities. Communities have their own wisdom. And we need, like, it is high time that, um, and it is not just for mental health professionals, but it is just in general for, ever, uh, for, um, for anywhere that, where we see power. We need to listen to various communities and what is the wisdom within the community and what are they practicing and how we can, uh, yeah, how we can use their language and how we can uh, uh, and shape the discourse um, surrounding the community and keeping the community at the center and not just like uh, having a top down approach and just uh, um, throwing uh, languages and discourses that is coming from a very uh, Savarna uh, caste uh, yeah, uh, standpoint. And the fourth thing that I want to uh, stress upon is again, state needs to um, take ownership. 
passing a legislation does not mean anything. It means shit to me. Um, and in Indian context, we are seeing rap, like rampant uh, privatization of uh, various uh, 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 responsibilities that was actually of state. Uh, the health sector with ROK, the health sector with uh, this, um, this uh, uh, I'm forgetting the scheme that the government brought in. Um, but like the health sector is completely privatized. Uh, uh, Ayushman, yeah. So the health sector is completely privatized you know, by using the Ayushman scheme that's there. And, uh, and the, there is no discourse uh, and the uh, mental health sector per se, I do not see state taking up ownership over here. It is the primary responsibility of the state and not the private players. Private players will do their own bidding. And we need to understand that thing very specifically. It will do the bidding of their of the funders. So that is something with which we need to understand, and we need to stress upon that state needs takes responsibility. And again, keeping the communities at the center, not what is not having a top down approach and just pushing down um, the the top down structures that is there. Um, and yeah, recognizing community wisdom. So these are the points like that I can think of when we when I think of way forward. Thank you so much, Christy, uh, for stressing upon uh, the need for the state to take uh, take control or action. Uh, we actually have two questions that came in, so uh, we'll get to those questions very quickly. After anybody else on the panel would like to add a few words about how do you see this going forward. Um, I'd like to just add to a couple of points, um, mostly agreeing with what Christy said. I do believe there needs to be state-sponsored interventions, but um, I also would like to add that interventions need not necessarily be with respect to mental health services, but also taking a um, taking a honest and a blatant view that you know some of these caste atrocities, caste-based discrimination. All these kinds of trauma um, inducing activities are still very much on as long as we don't intervene into these very blatant acts of violence, there will be continued trauma they will continue there will be continued impact on a marginalized community so there's no point in not interve intervening where the actual impact is happening and just intervening with respect to mitigation and addressing some of the uh, adverse impacts that has already happened. So I would just like to include that within the gamut of uh, state-sponsored intervention. Secondly, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, in, during our preparatory session, I don't think this whole um, inclusive uh, incremental initiatives around having a bit of cultural sensitivity, just changing our language, just changing our vocabulary, I don't think this is going to work. At least as far as marginalized communities are concerned, we absolutely need to be aiming for a complete overhaul of the system that's currently at play. Uh, in our communities, and I can say this as a person who's experienced this many times firsthand, is that mental health is still a lug accessing mental health services is still a luxury. And I don't just mean that from a monetary perspective, I mean that uh, from the fact that, you know, no one has the time or the um, or the or the uh, or the or the space or the luxury or the affordability to look at uh, to go to a therapist to to get that mental health care like you you don't you don't usually prioritize it you tend to prioritize other things and mental health is usually some of the last thing uh, that you're worried about so this kind of wisdom this kind of understanding will not come unless you are with the community, you are from the community, uh, you are accessing, as Chris Lee rightly pointed out, that community wisdom, that's not going to happen. So I think most of us are fairly uh, in on the same page with respect to, you know, moving on from this individualized sort of a setup, this colonized sort of a setup. So I, I agree with that too. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. Anybody else would like to quickly go and then uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so we'll take the questions. Yes, Zera. I will just sort of put it in a nutshell because that's what I have thought about. Is that one way to go forward is for mental health slash psychology slash psychotherapy to unabashedly accept that it is political. This apolitical business is not going to work. It's just not going to work. So, you know, 
the point is the moment i think i'm 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 going back to something trusty said the moment it remains individual centric its focus on individual renders it apolitical as if there's no power configurations that bring people into place it's not power is not only oppression power is what constitutes it's the way people learn to negotiate with each other uh, and well i think that's the first thing that you learn in family who to talk to who to evade how to talk to who the first configuration the first political lesson that we learn is actually in the family so i'm just saying that the problem with with uh, psychotherapy or mental health is that it has deluded itself into believing or it is deluded to believe that it is in this individual centric neutral space where it doesn't want to take sides where it it wants to be and uh, I, i think that this idea of let's accept everyone let's be nice to everyone let's be empathetic it actually comes from that space it's not possible and I, and and i think till the time we accept that there are pa there are pa uh, power configurations there are people who are oppressed there are people who are oppressors sometimes it's a mix i think till the time we can admit it and explore it we will not be able to even imagine an inclusive face forget talking about it and to talk politics to talk about how we are implicated you may not be interested in politics trust me politics is very much interested in you <laughs> so that it, it doesn't help i'm able so this a political business needs to go that's all i have to say okay um um there's one question that just came in from anisha Anisha says, "In reality, when the state is becoming anti-decent and justice, let alone mental health, um, how do we check that the community care we are proposing also checks that psychologists have support to unlearn and relearn?" Yes, Rahul. Uh, I'm just going to read the question again for the benefit of everybody, and I'll you can uh, unmute yourselves uh, accordingly. So, in reality, when the state is becoming anti-decent and justice alone, mental health uh, and or uh, how do we check that community care that we are proposing also checks that psychologists have support to unlearn and relearn so i think this question is more about focused towards the psychologist or psychotherapist how do you, how how is it how do we ensure that the checks of the professionals are happening uh so i would actually like uh, ask uh, would asta like to speak first she is also uh, you can go ahead rahul I'll follow up thank, if i have anything thank you asta uh, actually uh, this is something that i'm also, that i also personally am really concerned about because right now in india we have one governing body that's called the rci so basically as a psychologist if you're getting a clinical psychology degree that is rci approved you're going to be a member of the rci the rehabilitation council of india right uh, but apart from that there is no governing body there is no governing body and that is uh, i think i mentioned earlier also uh, during the talk that you know if somebody does something wrong nothing would happen to us so uh, there needs to be as far as i'm concerned there needs to be uh, you either need to expand the scope of the rci uh, where they begin to understand that these are the mal practices that are actively happening uh on the ground uh and uh, you build education and re-education systems and uh uh enforcement mechanisms to check that mental health professionals actually sort of uh follow them on the ground and there be you know there should be legal consequences for the kind of mistakes that happen like you know uh, a client like this uh, this is very recently um i was in a webinar another webinar where a where a school teacher mentioned that she actually she had to have a, a very serious conversation with one of her students because the students con- the, the student continuously told her that the, that her therapist and uh this uh, the student were hanging out and going to movies together that is an absolute ethical no no so you know and and i'm using that example that's a very st- that's a very uh, you know you could say that's a very surface level example but those are the kind of things that uh, you need to sort of be able to address uh, and be, because the the therapist genuinely thought that uh, they were doing the right thing that there was nothing wrong with with what they were doing 
So there's so much that needs to be done in that regard. And there needs to be a governing code of ethics for mental health, uh, just like there is for, you know, just like there is the Med Medical Council of India. Uh, so there needs, so that, that's what probably needs to happen on that front. Yeah. Thanks, Rahul. Asta, did you, uh, did you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add, I mean, absolutely what Rahul said that, um, you know, uh, there is no governing body and, and even, even as, you know, even as therapists and psychologists, there are a lot of times when we feel lost as well. You know, we don't know where to go to, who to go to. Um, I think introducing uh, cultural ethnic context in our training and education system uh, also, uh, you know, I mean, I'm saying this uh, with all my heart that it's important for all therapists to take the onus and the responsibility to actually go out there and sensitize themselves <clears throat> for, uh, you know, for the for the learning process. I know I've been doing it and there's every time I learn something, I know there's so much more to, you know, go back to. Having said that, um, I so also I think boundaries need to be defined clearly here that in case you, uh, you know, <clears throat> we're moving towards more specializations. We're moving towards, you know, representation and, you know, uh, getting getting people from different communities to represent, uh, you know, their thought processes onto a therapeutic alliance that we, they form with their clients. Um, I think it's okay for a lot of therapists to say no uh, when they when they can't. Instead of getting into a therapeutic alliance or a relationship with someone where they are unable to understand and they're struggling to understand, it it is important for them to say no and direct them to you know, someone who may be able to help them better. That is a great unlearning uh, or learning that we can, you know, that we can do. Uh, it is important for us to recognize, and this is a responsibility that lies with, within us. And even if there is no, uh, I understand that there is no governing body, like a legal governing body that we have, which identifies our rights, our ethics, we, we have rights as well, right? Uh, and a lot of those get violated also and you know our ethics the ethics that we're supposed to follow and all of that the code of conduct that we may need to follow as therapists there is no body for that however the education systems the education institutes that exist can can bring about a lot of change here you know in because well when they are teaching us everything else these are things that they can teach us also and with a little bit more emphasis okay thank you um, i just want to add on to this discussion per se. Um, I don't think a governing body is required, it should be there. But at the same time, um, this, I, I don't know, uh, I, when, we were, when you, the discussion was taking place, I was just thinking of Dr. Pail Tarvi. Uh, there was a governing body, there were structures in place, but still the incident took place and nothing happened to the perpetrators, nothing happened to the Three uh, uh, to uh, to the uh, people who pushed uh, Dr. Pail Tarvi, who actually murdered Dr. Pail Tarvi, and the entire institution that was there. So, uh, governing body hone se nahi pata kitna changes aayenge. And the other thing that I want to talk about, since the question was with respect to state, and earlier I did say ki state needs to take action. But at the same time, we need to realize that Savarkarites RSS BJP is running the state. And I don't see any hope. We need to relentlessly question them. But I don't see any hope from the Savarkarites, RSS, BJP people running the state. All right. OK. Uh, thank you so much for that input. Um, the last uh, question is actually, um, we probably have one minute on it. Um, this, this can actually like, uh, I don't know if this is a question. I'd actually just leave it to the panel to see if they'd be comfortable taking it. Uh, but I feel like it's important to uh, uh, put this question forward because we spoke so much about decentralization and community healthcare and looking at health, uh, mental health as a political problem, right? Um, in that context, this question becomes very important. Um, would So the question is from Sam Rao. It says, would you counsel or advise a queer youth say originating in a small town of Maharashtra to go back in the closet if they felt the benefits versus risks of being out of the closet are not worth it. How would you then look at the bigger picture of the context? Yeah, uh, so this would be a very uh, difficult question to answer because a very you know basic surface level answer would be no. You know, because of what everybody, because of uh, everything that we know about identity and how uh, uh, closely it ties 
to uh, uh, your existence, your the way you perceive yourself, and to have to hide that uh, would you know? So on at a surface level, you would always say no, all right. But uh, like I think Zaira had said the other day, that identity is so much more than that, and uh, uh, so this would be a very complicated answer. Uh, I would need more in information to be able to help the person better if they needed to get away from that situation without facing risks. Uh, because I would never want somebody to go back, have to feel, have to feel like they have to go back into the closet. Because if uh, they stayed who they were, it would be a risk to them. Yeah, uh, Asta, Zera, both of you have. Yeah. Say, um, yeah. I just like to say that I don't think counseling. Uh, I mean, I need to. I think explain a little bit of context. I mean, what counseling essentially does. We can't counsel anyone to go in or come out of a closet, right? We are no one to tell anyone whether they should go in or they should not go in. The choice is completely the individual's. What a counseling process will do is that the counseling process will help, can help uh, this you know individual understand their own emotions, understand their own thoughts, evaluate their decisions, their, the consequences of the decisions, and take a call as to what they want to do. Because we are now, uh, you know, all like, because we have now spoken about, you know. Uh, being sensitive to uh, you know different types of identities does not mean that now we will start saying that okay no you have to come out of the closet or you have to do this or this is how we want to tell you or we're not going to you know empowerment is the ability to take your own decision and that I think is the essence of counseling the the onus of taking the decision will always lie on the individual whether they want to uh, you know uh, whether they want to be in the closet whether they want to come out and talk about it and I don't like the word closet personally. Um, you know, how they choose to display their identity or express their identity is their choice. We have to help them manage the emotions and the thoughts around it. All right. Thank um, you so I just quickly want to add to this thing. We also need to understand what coming out means. It is not just one thing or the other. And, it, and at the same time, it is a process. So maybe we can like help the person to see that as a process like if i have to talk about myself i am out to few of my friends i'm out in in the world but i'm not out to my father and he does not know about my gender identity or my sexual orientation but I, as he is not there in social media so it is a process and it is a negotiation and it is not just a one-time thing like even people and i would actually um, uh, if anyone wants to understand coming out, there is a re really nice interview by KP. Uh, uh, if, if if people can access that, and I'll send it to Ye Belong. Um, if people can access that and read that to understand what coming out means and to gauge, understand, and navigate through it. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Chrissy Zera, you wanted to say something quickly? Yeah. Quickly. Um... Again, completely what Asta said, it's really, uh, if that's what they want to do, uh, that's what we do. But again, the psychoanalytical part in me is saying, what exactly is the question? Because I don't think the question is, can they go back? I don't think that's the question. The question is, yes, they should go back. No, I think there's, there's something else. They're not asking about coming out and going in. There's, there's something else entirely, uh, which takes the form of this language. And say and uh, secondly, in the I think what is uh, just really one line in the discourse of bravery, we often forget that people can be afraid, yeah. and people are scared, and it's uh, it's difficult to talk about that, and it's okay to talk about it. There should be a place where you don't have to be brave all the time. Yeah. Where you can come and say, I think it's a mistake. I think I don't feel okay about it. I feel miserable. And I think therapy should be able to be that space so that you can be brave outside. You don't have to be brave in them. Yeah. Sounds that, that, thank you so much for uh, adding that actually. Um, yeah, actually we are, uh, we are dangerously out of, not dangerously out of time. We are actually out of time. Um, are, but uh, I would like to like thank every single panelist here for bringing such amazing, uh, interesting, insightful and much needed perspective and uh, discussion to this conversation each one of you here brought so much value to it uh, thank you so much again every single 
one of you, every single one of you, Asta, Christina, Christy, Zara, Rahul. I'm just reading out names in the way I can see you on my screen right now. But thank you so much for being here. 